Well, living life on purpose, and I want to focus specifically this morning about knowing your Creator. It seems to me that if you don't have something, then you can't bless the other person. You can't pass on what you do not have, which is why I'm focusing on, on this topic of your Creator, especially the, the love of the Creator who created each and every one of us individually. <clears throat> So, why are people, you and me, are craving for love, for acceptance, for appreciation, for affirmation, for kind words to be spoken to you, about you, for you? Why do you crave for forgiveness? That's where we're going today. I mentioned this in my email. Um, this doesn't just happen outside of the church. It happens inside of a church as well. The human craving of the heart for all of that, for love, for acceptance, for appreciation, for affirmation, for kind words speaking about you, for you, for forgiveness. Do you know why? Because you were created by the very God that the Bible calls Love. God is love. This is why <clears throat> when evolution um, said that the monkeys and gorillas and the fish and all of that are common with human beings, what they didn't know is that we've got the same creator whose fingers, his marks right, run right throughout in everything that he did. There's a resemblance. And yet, you will not find a whale planning a holiday or thinking about yesterday or tomorrow or a tree crying because of this and that. The human beings are the apex, the very, very top of God's creation. We are the only ones that Genesis says that we were created in a very image of God and guess what that's why you have emotions and I have emotions like what I've just labeled over here <clears throat> that's why we have feelings it's because the one who created us has emotions and feelings so deep within the human psyche is the cry for all of this and I want to look at how we can arrive at answering some of those longings in the heart. You see, the reason why we actually argue is because we long to be understood. We long to be valued. We long for acceptance. Deep inside, <clears throat> we know that we ought to be loved, accepted, received, embraced, we want to be shown the attributes of the one who actually created us. We know this intuitively, deep within us. Christian or not Christian, people, this is why people are searching for this. It's because, it's because the God who made us in his very image has placed him within us. You read the book of Ecclesiastics, you will find out uh, everything under the sun and so forth. And right towards the last chapter, in chapter 12, it says, what is the conclusion? And the conclusion is to fear God and to honor him, because that's our lot. It's in, in other words, to know who actually created you and I. Very, very important for us before we can love others, we can value others, we can accept others, we can receive others let alone serve others, we must know the Creator's love. We must know the one who actually made us. Now, unfortunately, our upbringings, <clears throat> the world, our mates or friends, even school and churches, have 
really bettered us over the years. And so when we hear about God is love, we find it hard to accept God is love. We've been given a picture of God, a notion about who God is, and that's our picture. So when we think about God, God is love, and then you say, but this, but that. That's why you have lots of buts. It's because your experience <clears throat> is far from knowing God in any of these areas. <clears throat> and so I want us to really, and my prayer is that we will encounter God this morning. You see, in order to love God, you must first know God. You must meet Jesus personally. You must encounter who the Holy Spirit is. You must believe what the gospel says that Jesus paid for you. Paid for everything. He paid for your forgiveness. A lot of Christians are still struggling with sins. As if Jesus hadn't died. But you must believe. It takes your heart to believe that he has paid for everything. He's paid for your sins. That Jesus has truly forgiven you. Past, present, future. People struggle when they sin, like after the service or tomorrow. And they think that Jesus has to go back on the cross to die for the new sin that they have just done. No, the Bible says the sins of the past, present, and future were dealt to, to the cross. Read the book of Hebrews and you will find out very, very soon this high priest who entered into the Holy of Holies debunked the old system of sacrifice how sins were dealt to in the Old Testament, killing animals after animals after animals. book of Hebrews says, they had to do that year after year after year because it was never enough. They could never remove the consciousness of sin within their hearts. But when Jesus came, the Bible says he did it once and for all. And my longing and my desire for all of us, brothers and sisters in Christ, is that we will grab hold of that. So when you sin next time, major on the blood. Go there, major on the blood, major on the forgiveness. Go to the forgiveness of your sins. Don't have a pity party. That opens the door wide, so, so widely for the devil to hit you. If you study the book of Romans, you will find there is a progression from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 8. And it paints the picture on how helpless we were before Jesus died. Give you an example. Chapter 5, verse 8. And God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It doesn't mention there that you had to clean up that you had to improve anything for Christ to die for you. He died while you were mess up, messed up. He, and that death is still covering you now when you're messed up. You see, that, that is why the gospel is called too good to be true, because he covered the past, the present, and the future. But a lot of us don't really believe that. You feel so bad when you sin, that you want something to happen. And what you really want to happen is for Jesus to die again. That's why you hear prayers like, oh, Jesus, please. This and this and that. You see, what we're supposed to do is you just say, sorry, Jesus, for whatever. And if you knew what you were doing, sorry for doing what. They used the old words in, those, in the past, it's called commission and omission. Sins of commission and omission, sins that you know and the sins that you don't know. You're supposed to acknowledge, you have to pray biblical prayers. Sorry, Jesus, for sinning. And then straight away, don't stop there. 
Thank you, Jesus, for the blood that wiped that sin. Get up, move on. No time for pity party. Because you will find <clears throat> the longer you dwell on why you sin and on a sin, the bigger that sin becomes. And then it will overwhelm you. It will cripple you, and you will not know the God of love. You will not know the God of forgiveness. You will not know the God of acceptance. You will not know the God who impels you, and he wants to change you. Believe that Jesus has truly forgiven your sins. You really have to believe the new you. There is a new you within you. It's called a new creation. That's what Jesus created within you. It's the new creation. You have to major on a new identity. Don't think about the old person. Think about the new person. For many, many years, I believed that when I became a believer, the old me is still alive there somewhere. And now the new me and the old me are now competing for my attention. Very wrong. That picture is very wrong. <clears throat> when Jesus died for you, he killed the old person. Now that might be news for some of you this morning. He actually killed the old Jew. It's called the old man. Again, look up the um, book of Romans. Let me quote to you Romans 6, for example, just to give an example. But reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. See, dead indeed to sin, but alive to God. Because the old person that used to be actually died. Now you might say, but how come I have the, still the same emotions, same feelings, same thinking? Because the mind that you had before you met Jesus is still your mind, your brain. How do you deal with that? Romans 12 verse 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, to the thinking of, of this world or how this world tick, but renew, but, uh, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? The Bible. That's why I keep saying Sunday after Sunday after Sunday to kick out the, the, the thinking of the old you. Unfortunately, the old you is, has died, but the, the brain and the mind and the soul that used to be with the old one is still hanging around. And that soul that mind has to be transformed with new information. Out with the old, new, in with the new. You have to fill your mind, your feelings, your emotions, your hopes, your dreams from this book. Read what the Word says about the new you. Study the new you and then walk out the new you, that new identity. For whoever's in Christ, he's a what? New creation. Old things have gone. Behold, all things are new. So your spirit is new, but your brain, your thinking is still attached to the old. However, the more you put in new information, the new you, study who the new you is and what the new you looks like and go after that, then the old you, the old thinking, will start to die off. It will fade. It will come a point. Let's say, for example, you used to be a very angry person, to use an example. And that anger was attached to the mind of the old person. You are now a Christian, you're now born again, you admit Jesus, you admit the Holy Spirit, and situations come up to press the button. When you renew yourself with the Word of God, and the Word of God says that anger is not connected to the righteousness of God. Just use that for example. Now you know, it says that that anger you used to have, 
it doesn't give that righteousness of God an incredibility. And yet the righteousness of God is you. Can you see? With new information, it helps you to say, oh, so the new me doesn't line up with being angry and hold, holding grudges. And the more you know those information, the more you will go after the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. So now, your mind is saying that the new me has self-control. When the button is pressed, you say to that anger, not anymore. I have self-control. In Jesus' name, I have self-control. And then practice that. Day in, day out. I am the righteousness of God, which is why I taught you, I don't know how many years now, to look in the mirror and proclaim who you really are in Christ Jesus. You are no longer, you are no longer a sinner, you're a saint in Christ Jesus. I wish that wasn't taught in our churches, but unfortunately, I grew up with that preaching that we are sinners saved by grace. It was true once, but once I met grace and truth, it's no longer true. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I am a believer in Christ Jesus, and I'm a saint. Now, religion will hate that. They will say, well, what about the sin you just did yesterday? Parking in a... Or, oh, should I say, going to McDonald's or eating hamburger does not make you... Oh, going to McDonald's does not make you a hamburger. That's right. Two different things. You sin because we're in a fallen world. You sin because your mind is not saved. Your body is not saved. That's why you sin. That's why I sin. But the Bible says, Jesus has dealt with all your sins. And the whole purpose of repentance, which means to turn around, is turn around 180 degrees, is you turn from the sin and turn to God. That's what repentance is. Not pity party. Turn around. But that turn around takes a choice. You make a choice. You're either going to gravel in the sin you, you, you've done, or you turn to Jesus. And the more you turn to Jesus the more this new identity of yours will blossom. Now, now you know the new identity, let me give you how God actually sees you, especially, especially now you're a born-again believer. This is what the Bible says about those who have God living within them. That scripture from Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy. This is what angels are singing day and night, 24-7. Forever, forever, forever. They will never stop. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Can you see now? You were, you are created for God's pleasure. And I've labored all of that to really, for you, hopefully one of this will stick with you today, that God smiles when he looks at you. A lot of people think that when God looks at them, um, you know, he closes his eyes and says, oh, I don't want to look at that ugly person over there and so sinful and no good, always failed. See, they've got a totally wrong picture of what the Bible teaches. I mean, you are a son, you are a daughter of the living God, the one who created you. Jesus paid the price, and now when he looks at you, he doesn't see sin. He sees the glory of Jesus Christ. The very one who saved you is living in you. You don't look ugly to him. He loves looking at you, and you better believe it. 
you better believe it. God is for you and not against you. A lot of people complain when things go wrong. Oh, God, why, 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 why? This has happened again. And yet the Bible says it's not him who's just caused that problem. It's either the devil, your thinking, your lunch, or the world. Something caused it, not God. The Bible says in Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, how clear is that? It tells you he's not against you. He is for you. From the moment you awake, to go to sleep. And in Paul, lists a long, long, long list of things. Famine, nakedness, persecution, and on and on, present, the future. Demons, angels. He says nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing can come between you and the love of Christ. So there's nothing. There's nothing. He is for you. He is for you. That's why I love that, uh, you know, that blessing song. And there's a line that they, they call out. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. With the hope that you will actually receive it. That God is for you. Not against you. God loves thinking about you all day long. I remember when I when I uh, stumbled on this because I knew the verse very well from the NIV quotation. For I know the, the plans I have for you, says the Lord. This is the NIV plans not to uh, harm you, but to prosper you and give you um, hope and future. But when I saw this in the New King James Version and the King James, it says, For I know the thoughts I think towards you. And when I saw that, and I thought, wow. You mean you're thinking about me right now? And then I look at the Bible and say, yeah, that's what it is. For I know the thoughts I have towards you. He is thinking. Now, do you think when God is thinking about you, he's thinking about punishing you? He's thinking to to curse you and make life miserable for you? Is that what you think that God is thinking about you? Well, the NIV says, not calamity, not bad things, but hope and future. He tells you what he's thinking about. So he looks at you and says, oh, I want my son to have the best future, best job, best health, best relationships. I love him. I love her. That's the kind of thinking that he's, it's going on in heaven for you. Why? Because the verse above says he takes pleasure. You know what pleasure is? God takes pleasure just looking at you. Each of those lines, I, I say you better believe it. You better believe it. You better believe it. This is the new you. Get rid of the old mentality. Get rid of those voices that accuse you, that brings up all the excuses under the sun why you should be stuck in the past. And there are many of us who are stuck in the past. You heard of the ladies. It's a, an old story. Who used to roast uh, whenever she cooks a roast, she will cut off the ends of the roast. And even when she got a very nice big oven, she still cuts off the roast. No, the roasting pan is about that big now, but the roast is still chopped up about here. So out of interest, the daughter asked one day, how come it's been cut off? And the answer was, because mom did it. And a lot of us are like that. Because my family said so. My mates said so. Because the community said so. Because so and so said so. So you are stuck in the past. You don't know what the word tells you, who you're supposed to you are. I was taught that in this life, being a sinner, you just have to grin and bear it until you drop it, and then hooray, you are in heaven. 
Well, I thought that was, that was quite a negative kind of message to pass out to anybody who is not a Christian. Because if you just have to grin and bear it until you drop dead, what's the point of becoming a Christian? You're just as miserable as everybody else. But you see, for thy pleasure, they are and were created. So it's far from green and bear it. God says, I, I take pleasure. When I think about you, when I look, up, look at you, when I know who you are, in Christ Jesus, I just wish you would believe me. I just wish you would grab hold of this identity that I have given you. I hope you can see that, brothers and sisters. You see, later on, we will receive communion. And communion is a reminder to us what everything I've just preached about. When you hold that covenant piece of bread, you better recall what Jesus has done for you. And believe with all your heart when you receive the body and the blood. Believe it with all your heart that he has renewed you. He has given you a new you. You are not the same. You are not the same. Do you know what else? Look at this. Do you know what a masterpiece is? For we are God's masterpiece. Masterpiece. Just think about that. A masterpiece stands out from everything within a workshop of any artist. When he or she has a masterpiece, it stands out. It stands above everything else. One of a kind. Because the S jumps in there. You are one of a kind. You better believe it. Do you believe that you're one of a kind? Now, we know from science that there's no duplication of fingerprints, which is why it's being used as a security measure. Now, if you know that there's no duplication of fingerprints, then you know that there's only one you in this world. When you die, there's no more you. Nobody has it. Think about that. Extremely unique, an unrepeatable miracle. Have you ever thought about yourself as an unrepeatable miracle? That there's only been one, one and only one Jonathan in this world. And when he's gone, there's no more Jonathan. Have you ever thought about that? That you are the only, 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 only one? And that you are actually God's masterpiece. Now, this will go against everything that you've been accused of, being taught, or named that you've been called. But, brothers and sisters, this is the gospel. This is who you are in Christ Jesus. Everything in heaven and on earth is called an inheritance. Jesus foresaw that. In the book of Hebrews, he says he saw the cross, but he said he saw the, the joy, the joy. He saw the joy. Even though he was heading towards the cross, he saw the joy past the cross. Do you know who the joy is? It's you. It's me. And Jesus was saying to himself, this is worth, this is worth it. This is worth the pain, the ridicule. I mean, the Bible says he came to his own, and his own did not know him, reject him. And yet, there was a joy. He went through all the sufferings, and the pains, and all of that because of you. I really hope you're receiving this. I really hope that you can actually um, embrace this and see yourself in a new light who you really, really, really are when Christ looks at you. You don't have to grin and bear it and just drop and say, Hooray, I'm in heaven. That's too late. He died 
for you to have life in all its fullness. That's what the Bible says. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The one that's actually missing your life right now is him. Stealing, killing, destroying. But I have come that they, that they is you and me, that they may have life and have it abundantly. But in order for you to know what he paid for, get into the word, study the word, pray the word. When our daughter Rosetta Joy was born, and she was prophesied, so she was number five in our family. And in a, in a weekend mission, where Sandra and I were, were part of a, an itinerant ministry, this prophet guy prophesied over Sandra, because you know, Sandra was about six months pregnant in that stage, six or seven. And he said, this will be a blessing from God that will bring joy to your life, being your first daughter. Four boys so far, being your first daughter. And that's why her name today is Rosella hyphen Joy. When we were in Chimaru, um, Sandra was having labor, and we got a bassinet. And I remember in the night, the nurses were asking us, you know, do you know what you have? Yes, yes, we're going to have a, a girl. Oh, did you have a scan? No, a prophet said. And uh, she was very, and said, oh, really? So you know what you're going to have? Yes, yes, we're going to have uh, a girl, first girl. And she had to come back the next day. She finished her shift, but she had to come back the next day to make sure we had a girl. And on a bassinet, I hung the words, you are an unrepeatable miracle. On the bassinet. And you know what? You might as well hang that in your home as well, on your mirror, when you look at yourself. There is no one like you. You really, 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 really must believe that. And this is why I'm saying that you must believe that. Brothers and sisters, in your heart, the first, first purpose in life is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, spirit, and all of that, your strength. To love God with all as a husband, father, grandfather, friend. Wife, mother, grandmother, friend, brother, uncle, friend, sister, aunt, friend, a helpful work colleague, the one who blesses others with your presence, with your skills, your talents, your abilities, and a sanctified personality. This is what happens when you receive all of the above that we've been talking about. The day and a moment you receive what Jesus paid for is the day when all of these start to fall in place. If you want to be that father, that mother, that uncle, that aunt, that brother, that sister, that work colleague, that friend that carries the presence of God, you must accept yourself as God sees you, as the Creator sees you. You must accept yourself. You must let go of the past. The past does not shape you any longer unless you allow it. If you allow the past, then the past will dominate you. But you do not have to stay there. My friends, you do not have to stay there. You do not have to stay there. Everything is being offered to you. 
Everything has been given to you. Please receive what Jesus has paid for. I've written a prayer um, to conclude with. And I'm going to leave this on during communion so that as we take communion, you, you can say these kind of words to Jesus. Say it slowly, say it meaningfully, and really picture Jesus standing in front of you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me personally. You, pers you better personalize this. Never mind about the person next to you, but for you personally. When you take the communion, make it Jesus and you personally. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving all my sins. All, I mean all. Past, present, and the ones I haven't even committed yet. The ones I will commit tomorrow, next week, next year, 10 years from now, however long I'm going to live. Thank you, Jesus, for laying them all to rest. I am a forgiven person. And you have to walk around as a forgiven person. Think of yourself as a forgiven person. Now, if obviously, if there are issues that you need to forgive somebody or somebody to forgive you, you have to sort it out with God. Now, some of you are looking at me, how do I do that? Well, I wasn't going to mention this, but it's very simple. If it's you against the other person, you release the unjust or whatever it is that was done to you and let it go to God. You just let it go to God. You say things like, let's say the person is Bill. Bill is not in front of you, but as you speak, Bill is a spirit and you're a spirit and God is a spirit. Your words are powerful, the Bible says. So what's going to come out of your mouth next is very powerful. Death and life is in the power of a tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. Proverbs 18, 20. So you say things like, Bill, I know that the harm that you've done to me is enormous and so forth and so forth. But today, Bill, I am not your judge. Because that's the only reason why it hurts. You demand justice. You want the other person to be punished. That's why it hurts. You demand justice. But it's a time, it's time to let go of that. Because the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Bill is a sinner, you're a sinner, but you are now a saint in Christ Jesus. So you and Bill are on the same page. If Christ wasn't present, you are on the same page as him. So you have to let go of this justice issue. So, Bill, you acknowledge first, Bill, you have hurt me, da da da, da and so forth, and don't dwell there too long. Just acknowledge what Bill has done. And in Bill, as of this day onwards, I declare with my own mouth, I am not your judge. I am not your judge. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the only one and the only one judge who judges the living and the dead, the Bible says. And because of that, Bill, I release you into Jesus' hands. Any thought that's going to come about this event in the future, I release all of them to Jesus. Jesus shall deal with them because he's the only one that qualifies to judge. And then after that, if you really, really want to be free, you do what Jesus says. Bless those who misuse you. Pray for those who persecute you. So what do you do? Bill, with the faith that the Lord Jesus has given me, I bless you. So I release you, I release you Bill, into Jesus' hands, and I bless you. I bless you, Bill, with all the faith I have in Christ Jesus right now. Now the reason why it will be hard, because you are still wanting Bill to be punished. Please let go. Let that go. Because so long as you want to even the score, you are now coming over to God's territory. He's the only one that can pass judgment. If you want to even the score, you now want to be the judge. 
but he is the only judge. So don't struggle. Simply humble yourself. It's, it's your pride that's why it's hard. Just kick that pride out and say, pride, just be quiet in Jesus' name. I want to be set free from Bill. So, Bill, I'm not your judge. I release you into Jesus' hands. And Bill, with all the faith I have, I bless you. I bless you, Bill, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You bless him. Even when you don't feel like it. This is when feelings and emotions are, are irrelevant. Because you want to speak words from the Bible to release you from Bill. So even when you don't feel like it, speak it. Death and life are in the power of your speaking. I bless you, Bill, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if Bill happens to be a relative, you go to the next step. The Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible also says to love the household of God. If Bill happens to be a relative and is a believer, oh, now you are really getting deeper. So not only you bless Bill, but you say, Bill, in the name of Jesus, I love you as a brother. Now that's a powerful declaration there. The very one that hurts you and now you're declaring love upon him. And then to finish everything, you say, Bill, may the Lord bless you. Not only I have blessed you, but may the Lord bless you. And may whatever he has in terms of purpose be fulfilled in your life. I have seen numerous people pray that prayer. And by the time we finish the session, they are done. They are done. One woman that we prayed this prayer many, many, many years could not even sleep because of a sense of unworthiness. Low self-esteem, etc., 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 etc. See, you don't need to go to a counselor. Just turn to the counselor. His name is Holy Spirit. And you do what I've just told you. Man, when we finished praying, she said, all the noises have stopped. She could hear accusations in her head and she could hear why she's is no good and this, that, and they were coming from everywhere. But as soon as the prayer is finished, we walked through exactly what I walked through. They stopped. And I said to you, do you know why? The legal doors have been closed. Legal doors. Satan is one of those legalists. If he can find a reason why to attack, Steal, kill, and destroy, he will do it. And that's one of the areas that he loves, loves using. Unforgiveness. So that's how you do it. You release, bless, tell Bill that you love him. And you know what? Next time you see Bill, something has changed. You would notice something has changed within you. There's no more that kind of a yucky feeling within you. There's no more of that wanting to get even. It's like the emotions of World War Three have gone out of you. You don't want to punish him anymore because the Christ in you has risen up in the cleansing of your sins and everything he wants to bless you with is now bubbling up within you and now you are really a free person. Bill might have even been dead for 20 years. But when you think about Bill now, there's no more stingingness to it. There's no more ouch from within. He is free. You are free. 
And do you know the best thing of all? The Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. When you release Bill, Bill is delivered to Jesus. Now it's up to Jesus and Bill to sort out the business. It's no longer yours. Vengeance is mine. God says, leave all of that vengeance and trying to get even. That's my business. Give it over to me. I will deal with Bill. I will deal with Susan. I will deal with Mary. I will deal with Bob. Give it over to me. My friends, God does a much, much better job than any of us can. Well, that's being thrown in for free this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving all my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for healing me, for prospering me, for blessing me with every blessing. Do you think of yourself as a blessed person? As a prospered person or broke person? As a healed person or forever being chased by diseases and sicknesses? However you see yourself, that's what you become. So thank Jesus for what he's paid for. Thank you, Jesus, for healing me, prospering me, blessing me with every blessing. And then you say, Jesus, I surrender my life, my whole life, to your hands today. <laughs> so this, uh, as, as I said, I want to leave this on the screen while we have communion. Practice this. Practice letting go. Practice surrendering, giving to Jesus, and see what Jesus will do in return. Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior, and best of all, be my best friend. See, he has to be your best friend. While you're cooking, you talk to Jesus. While you're driving a car, you're talking to Jesus. While you're walking, you're talking to Jesus. Let him be your best friend. I receive your love, Lord Jesus. I receive your forgiveness. Amen. Practice that during communion. So uh, as the music is playing in the background, as we come to receive communion, please receive this. Pray this aloud. Hold the bread, hold the cup before you receive. If you want to picture him on the cross, whatever, there's a cross over there. Picture him dying for you and say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I receive Jesus what you paid for. And just let uh, your heart and your whole being acknowledge him for what he has done. And today could be a miraculous day for you. It could be a day when you walk out of church different than when you arrived in church. Okay? So it's time for us to have communion. I'm going to pray very soon. And I want, I want you, you know, you can look up and pray those uh, quietly or silently. But have a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus this morning. Because I long for you to walk in freedom. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I want you to be free. You, sh you ought to be a free person. There shouldn't be anything that's holding you back anymore. You must be free. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for uh, the communion we're about to receive as the elders uh, get it ready for us, Lord. We want to say thank you, Jesus, for everything that you did on that cross that reverberates not only to our age, but the Bible says into eternity. It's even hitting heaven right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sacrificing your life so that your love can be experienced by every person who is here this morning. Jesus, through your Holy Spirit, I pray and we pray in your mighty name, help us to encounter you in a fresh, in a new, miraculous way this morning. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Jesus, as we pick up that cup. We will recall your words that this cup represents the new covenant sealed by my blood. When we pick up the cup, we will also hear you saying, share this among yourselves. When you eat this bread, remember me. We will remember you, Jesus. And we thank you for being present in this building, in this place. And even those who are watching, Lord, on Zoom, thank you. Thank you for these special encounters. We give you all the glory and all the honor, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.